live in a quiet, nice, suburban neighborhood with mostly old people or families with kids. When I was younger, around the age of 8 to 12, me and my two brothers, we'll call them J and K, one's a twin and the other is two years younger than me, as well as my neighbor, we'll call him C. We used to play a game on my block outside at night that we liked to call Murder Run. Sometimes other kids would join in if my brother or I had friends over, so most of the time it was six or more people. The rules of the game were that one person, or sometimes two, would go hide somewhere on our street within the boundaries that we set. Usually, the boundaries were about 60 feet to the right of my house and to the end of the block to the left. There were no rules on where you could hide, so sometimes someone would be behind a tree or other times behind a car. The hiders would be called the murderers. Our house was in the middle of the two boundaries, so you could go two ways. The rest of the group, who we would call runners or the victims. While the murderers were running to hide, the rest of us would sit on the front steps of my house, close our eyes, and we would count to one minute. After the minute had passed, we would open our eyes and decide which way we wanted to go. Usually, the group would split up. One section goes right, and the other goes left. The groups would pretty much just walk in the direction towards the boundaries, looking for shadows or under cars to see if we could see the murderer. Eventually, when the murderer would see us, hopefully, when we couldn't see them, they would jump out from wherever they were hiding and chase us back to the house. If the murderers caught you before you touched the front steps, you had to play the murderer in the next round. The murderer carried a small wooden sword that they would tag you with. It didn't mean anything in the game, but it added to the fun. This comes into play later. One time, it was me, my two brothers, his one friend who we will call H, and our neighbor playing, so overall it was five of us. I think it was about 8.30 or 9 p.m., and it was September, so it was starting to get cold and dark earlier in the day. We had already been playing a few rounds, and we were starting to get tired, so we decided to play one more round and then call it a day. This time, it was C who had to be the murderer, since he hadn't had a chance yet. So we gave him the wooden knife, and we turned around and started counting. Once we finished counting, we decided who would go what way. My brother J was the fastest and wanted to be cool, so he said he would go alone, but his friend H wanted to go with him. They were both fairly fast, so I knew that they would win the round if C was on that side. So off we went. Me and K went right, and J and H went left. I can't even describe how much adrenaline you felt, even when you knew you couldn't get hurt. That's why I love this game so much. As we were walking, I saw a small shadow from behind a thick tree, with C's hair obviously showing beneath the streetlight. Just as I was about to say that I saw him, I heard H and J scream from the other end of the boundary. Someone was chasing them too. They were both running and laughing, but I was not laughing. There were two possibilities here. Either the person behind the tree not even five feet in front of me wasn't C, or the person currently chasing my brother and his friend wasn't C. But I heard something behind me and turned around and C was standing there asking why they were running. But when he saw someone chasing them, his face went white. He was two years older than us and I had never seen him scared, but he looked like he was going to be sick. I whipped my head around and K started screaming at J and H to run. As soon as J and H saw C standing behind us, they turned around and realized that the person they were being chased by was not C. They stopped laughing and started running faster than I had ever seen them run in their lives. Instinctively, C, K, and I also started running back to the house. We were much farther away from the house than J and H. An important thing to note about the game is that even if the murderer is on one side, if the people who came that way make it back first, the murderer can still try to tag the others, even if you went the other way to find them. J and H were screaming now, but they weren't looking back. I could see that they were most likely going to get there after them, which worried me because I didn't want to lose the game. Yes, that was what I was worried about, until I saw what the man was holding. C was still holding the wooden knife, but whoever was chasing J and H was holding something shinier. I soon realized that he was holding an actual knife. At this point, my adrenaline was pulsing through me, and I couldn't think of anything besides what would happen if I got there after them. I screamed at K and C to leave me and run as fast as they could to the house, and they definitely did not protest. I was always the slowest, which meant I pretty much always lost. Luckily, it didn't seem like this other guy was very fast either. As I was running, I saw him a little better. He was wearing a black sweatshirt and black sweatpants, but his shoes were white, like bright white, not dirty at all. They looked like they were fresh out of the box, which didn't make much sense 
because the rest of his outfit was pretty scuffed up. When I got closer, I realized that his whole outfit was a little too small for him, like he was wearing all kids' sizes. It hit me that he must have been trying to look like a kid. Even his sneakers were too small for him, which may have explained the weird way he was running, like he had rocks in his shoes or something. I was still running, almost to the stairs. I spit out the blood in my mouth because of how hard I was biting inside of my cheeks. Finally, I saw J and H reach the stairs, with whoever this guy was maybe 10 to 15 feet behind them, just enough for me to beat him. C and K got to the stairs seconds after J and H, and I reached them just after. What happened next was one of the scariest things in my life. As soon as I reached the stairs, as the last one, whoever this guy was, just stopped, was standing on the sidewalk in front of our house like a horror movie with his head tilted to the side. I couldn't see his face. He was backlit by the streetlight, so all we could see was the silhouette of his tight-fit clothes. A bit of his mouth was surrounded by enough stubble to tell him he was in his mid to late thirties and the sharp object in his hand. My brother was fumbling at the door to get it open and the rest of us were just crying, me the most as I was holding my little brother. But then he just walked away, like he literally just walked down the street and around the corner. But right as he got to the little drops of blood I had spit out, he stopped and turned his head back and smiled at me, then continued walking. I took that moment to bust the door down and drag everyone inside, lock it behind me and tell my parents what happened. We didn't call the police because my dad went outside and couldn't see anyone. And after we told him that he went around the corner, my dad just assumed that he went into the woods. We made sure to lock all the doors that night. Now, the story mostly ends there since we never saw the man again. But the other night, as I was walking home from the bus, I remembered that story and I was still confused why the man left until a chill ran up my spine when I realized he was playing the game. The scariest part though, is that that night, we didn't explain the rules to anyone because everyone that was playing that night already knew the rules, which means that whoever was chasing us had been there prior to that night and had been there when we explained the rules at a different time. I still wonder why he didn't chase us before the last round. And I still wonder what would have happened if the two fastest runners didn't go that way and if it was me instead. It's still creepy that he knows where we live and I still get uncomfortable when I walk past that tree that I saw him come out of. I still wonder where he went and how long he had been watching us for. I'm much older now and my younger brother is too young to remember. I don't talk to C or H much anymore and I'm pretty sure J blocked it out of his memory. I don't want to bring it up to any of them, but part of me is curious how they remember that night or if they remember it at all. I'm a female and this is something that happened when I was 14 years old. I went on a lot of bike rides around the neighborhood that I lived in. When I did, I would often see an older man walking his dog around a certain area. Normally, I would just ride past him. One day though, I was going a bit slower when I was passing by the man and his dog. I was looking at the dog and I said that the dog was beautiful. Then I passed them and kept going. About 30 minutes later or so, I was on my way back home and I passed by the man's house again. He was outside with his dog still and stood in the road looking at me. He was kind of in my way and was basically stopping me so I came to a stop on my bike. The man said hi to me and we got to talking. Pretty early on in the conversation, he asked me where my house was and for some reason I told him my street. He then asked me which school I went to and what grade I was in. I told him my school and grade because I was young and I didn't know any better at the time. The houses in this area had a little bit of land. Behind the man's house in his backyard, there was a large woods. The man then told me that the wooded area behind his house led to a mall. Spoiler alert, there's no mall in that direction, and I knew that. That's when red flags started to raise in my head. I told the man that my mom really wanted me back home, and I started heading back to my bike. The man didn't stop me, and I was able to get back to my house. When I got home, I told my parents about it. A couple of weeks later, I got some chilling news. Apparently, my mom was talking to her friend about what had happened. Her friend said that the man was on one of those sex offender websites. So my mom, being who she is, saw the man outside when she was on a walk once. She confronted him and asked him if he told me that there was a mall behind her house. Then she told him that he had better not talk to me ever again. My mom said that the man was just kind of shocked and didn't even deny anything. To me, that's horrifying. I stayed away from him and his house after that.
Before I tell this story, I will give you some background. I live in a neighborhood that's slightly out in the country. It's not in the middle of nowhere, but probably about 40 minutes from the closest major city. The area has some farms and lots of woods and things like that. Because it's quieter around here and everybody has a little bit more land, there's more wildlife. I like to go on walks around my neighborhood because there's a lot of interesting things to see. I usually start at my house and walk along the side of the street because there are no sidewalks around here. I will go for about a half a mile to a mile and then turn around and head back. There are a few quiet streets that lead to other neighborhoods. I rarely see anybody driving or walking when I go on the walks. Occasionally, somebody walking a dog or something like that, but usually nothing. There's also a park nearby that's usually pretty quiet, but sometimes I go there and then head back. Now, to start this story, it was the evening and almost sunset. I was working a little bit later hours that week than usual. With it being the early spring, the sun also set kind of early as well. I walked from my house to the park that was a little less than a mile away. When I was on my way back, I heard a noise in somebody's yard. It was the space between one house and another, and there was a large amount of room between them. There were a few trees and bushes in that space. It was dark, but it sounded like maybe a larger animal was behind one of the trees. I stopped and looked. At first, I didn't see anything, but then what I did see shocked me. There was a man looking at me from behind one of the trees. It was really dark, but it appeared as though he was looking back at me. When he saw me, he then ducked behind a tree. This was kind of odd. I didn't think that the man lived there, and I didn't recognize him. Sure, I didn't know all of my neighbors, but this behavior was just strange, and it didn't seem like he lived there. But there wasn't much about it that I could do, so I kept walking home. Eventually, I made it back and everything was fine. But the very next night, I took another walk at around the same time. Once again, I saw this man. But this time, he was in a completely different neighbor's yard, kind of lurking around again. He kind of ducked behind a bush when I started to walk by. This made me a lot more nervous than I had been the previous night. I didn't even really bother to look over and just kept on walking home. The man stayed there as I moved past, and that night I was able to make it home safely as well. Each night after making it home, I would forget about the man. The very next night, I once again went on a walk after work. I went to the park, and this time, when I got to the park, the man was there. There was nobody else at the park, which was typical. It was usually really quiet. The guy was lurking around on the edge of the woods that surrounded part of the park. Overall, it was very suspicious. I decided to head back home almost as soon as I saw him. I was also kicking myself for even going out on a walk that night, forgetting about the suspicious guy lurking around the neighborhood. When I left the park, it only took about a minute before I heard the footsteps behind me. They were a ways back, but it was a quiet night, so it was very easy to hear. He was probably at least 50 feet behind me. I sort of looked back and noticed him way off in the distance. I tried to ignore it and kept going back home, but I was worried. What if the man followed me all the way back to my house? I also had no clue what he was even doing. Minutes went by and things remained the same. I suppose I could have called the police, but the man would have noticed. I also had no proof of him doing anything wrong. I also sort of half expected the guy to jump into somebody's yard at any time and lurk around like he had been. By the time I finally made it to my street, the guy was still behind me at about the same distance. I walked a little bit faster and was holding back everything within myself to not start sprinting right there. At long last, I reached my driveway. Now, I should mention that I have a really long driveway so I wasn't in the clear just yet. The guy was still probably 50 feet behind me. I walked quickly up my driveway and felt relief for a minute, expecting the man to pass by and keep going down the road. But when I was almost at my front step, I thought I heard him starting to enter my driveway area. I got out my keys to unlock the door as quickly as possible. My hands were shaking in the process, making it harder. I could hear his footsteps gradually getting closer to me as I did. It seemed as though they were speeding up as well. Finally, my door was unlocked and I swung it open. Once I was inside, I slammed it shut and turned the lock. Then I exhaled in relief. No more than five seconds later, I heard the doorknob turn. It wouldn't open though. The man was right outside and I was so scared that I ran to the opposite end of my house. A few minutes went by and I listened closely. I returned to the front of the house after not hearing anything for several minutes. When I did, I looked outside and the man was now gone. 
I looked out several other windows, but did not see him. After that night, I took a break from going on walks for a while. I'm not sure who the guy was, but I didn't see him again. This is a true story. It happened to my family, and it involved my firstborn son, who was just a couple of months away from his eighth birthday. He was in second grade at the time. We were living in Tacoma, Washington back then, and I must admit that it's forever changed my life, especially in my role as a mother. It's been 27 years since this occurred, but it still haunts me to this day. A little backstory to put these events into perspective. January of 1995 was a traumatic month for our family. My son, up to this point, had been walking to and from his bus stop. The bus stop was a block and a half away from our house. The walk was a small, hilly walk, down to it in the morning and up in the afternoons. During that month of January, an elderly man from the Korean grocery store across the street was brutally murdered. I could see the shop from our bathroom window, and we also survived our first earthquake. So you can see that this was a traumatic month from the start. My son was used to traversing the alleyway that ran between the back of the houses on our street and the back of the houses on the next street. We were so used to this that it had become commonplace and there was not a worry in the world as to our son's safety until that fateful day in January of 1995. As usual, our day had started in the typical fashion. I arose at 6 a.m. in the morning to begin preparing our children for school. Our second oldest was the first to leave because he was in special ed and had to be bused across the city to the west side of Tacoma. Then our oldest son left the house, as usual. We kissed goodbye and I watched as he walked through the small housing complex we lived in and out the gate and started down the alleyway. Now, my next oldest son, who was only four at the time, was ready to go off to preschool, while my youngest son, at the tender age of three, was still at home with mommy. After I got son number three off to school, then it was a typical day for myself, my husband, and our youngest. We lived in a small complex with four small houses, each one with a fenced yard and then another gate that enclosed the small complex. At the time of this incident, my husband and I were managing the property for our landlord and so we had recently rented out the house next door to us. The tenant was a sweet old black lady with a head full of gray hair and just as nice as can be. She would be a delight to live next to and key to what happened this particular afternoon. Now, I'm not going to go into detail of my daily routine, as that's all irrelevant. What happens next will start in the afternoon, at the usual time that I knew my oldest son would be coming home from school. I was busy in the house, tending to the household chores, when I heard a frantic knocking at my front door. I opened it, and saw through the screen door that it was my next door neighbor. I don't remember her name now, although I'll never forget her heroic actions that day. I asked her what was wrong, because she had a panicked look on her face, and she was yelling at me, saying that someone was trying to kidnap my son. She had stepped outside and seen what was happening, and then ran to us. I screamed for my husband, and we ran out the front door, and to my horror, a man in a white sedan was trying to grab our son and pull him into the vehicle. I was screaming and going ballistic, while my husband started running towards the car, screaming, Get your hands off my son, I'm going to kill you. And I was screaming, Kill him, hon. We were both staring in horror, while our son tried to get away. And then the man kept moving the car up a bit and opening his door to try to block our son. Our son's back was now against the fence that surrounded the complex we lived in. At one point, he actually had his hand on our son's arm and was about to pull him into the car when the neighbors heard the commotion and jumped into action. At this point, our neighbors who lived across the alley and were drinking buddies of my husband heard the commotion and both of them, two brothers, leapt over the six-foot fence sprinted around to the front of the perp's car, and then one brother, out of respect for their privacy, I'm not giving their names, swept up our son into his arms and hurriedly brought him back to me and said, here, mom. In the meantime, the man just sat there, stone silent in his car, not moving at all. I stared into his eyes, and I can tell you one thing. I had never seen such dark, soulless eyes as I did when I stared into that man's black eyes. I shivered because it was like I was looking into the very eyes of utter darkness, the devil himself. He actually sat there long enough that we were all able to get a complete physical description of the man, the vehicle, and the license plate. My neighbor called the police. Of course, before they arrived, the man finally sped off, throwing gravel and dirt up in the wake of his departure. 
I still shudder to this day when I think of what would have happened if my neighbors across the alley hadn't come to our defense. That perp would likely have gotten our son into the car, and we would have never seen him again. One other thing that upset me is right before the man left, he pulled out a Polaroid camera and rapidly took a couple of shots of our son. That really creeped me out so much. The police arrived soon thereafter, or should I say one police officer, who looked like he couldn't have been more than 25 or 26 years old. Definitely late 20s, and at the time, I was only in my early 30s, so not much younger than myself. He definitely looked as though he had just come out of the police academy. My advice to all police, don't send a rookie out to investigate child abduction cases or near abduction cases. That young officer eyed me skeptically and just said that I was a hysterical mom. I couldn't believe it. Of course I'm going to be hysterical. Someone just tried to abduct our son. I'm sorry, but that should have been handled by a seasoned detective. This scarred me for life, and for a long time, almost three years, I wouldn't let our son out of my sight and made him hold my hand everywhere we went. And obviously, I went to extremes to protect my other children as well. Of course, he grew up and became irritated with my overprotectiveness as I wouldn't let him out of my sight. He was almost ten and a half years old before he finally got out of the house and away from me, and that was because of his dad. He'd finally been allowed to leave the house and ride his bike down to the corner store. At this time, we were no longer living in the house where the near abduction attempt occurred. As I conclude this, our son is now 35 years old, happily married, and is a successful auto mechanic with his own shop and business. We no longer live in Washington state, but have moved to another state. God bless all of you and take care. It's a dangerous world out there.